Okay, here we are live. Uh, welcome everyone to the Defiant Weekly Recap. And um, also happy Thanksgiving to everyone celebrating. I hope everyone got time to uh, spend and enjoy with their families yesterday and that you all didn't receive too much hate for maybe previous uh you know, financial recommendations you may have given your family members in last year's Thanksgiving. Uh, speaking of that, we have a, a, a really great video on um, on just that, on how much times have changed. So let me see if I can uh, have a little call out to the video here. Um, thankful for crypto. Recommend you guys watch this. It's, it's hilarious. But... Uh, <laughs> other other than that, there were tons of things going on this week. So we're we're gonna you know break them down, analyze them. Uh, you'll get kind of the behind the scenes on how our reporters uh, wrote these stories. So big big news obviously continues to be FTX. Uh, right now we are specifically looking at the different ways. It, it's causing ripple effects in the in the crypto industry. The big one being DCG right now. There's questions about whether DCG, this huge conglomerate own, that owns Genesis, Grayscale, CoinDesk, and other properties, whether they will be impacted by by this. So we'll get into into that. In the beginning of the week, the FTX hacker was able to cash out some of uh, their their stolen funds. Big news this week was also all, all about, you know, the different aspects of privacy concerns in DeFi. Uh, first, Uniswap disclosed that they will share your wallet addresses if law enforcement tells it to. And then uh, more recently, consensus um, updated their their uh, their their policy saying that they are tracking wallet addresses and IP uh, of their users so that caused a, a, a lot of commotion in the space we'll talk about that very very recent news on rap BTC sliding off its peg um, redemptions being a bit slow and with everything that's happened that's causing a lot of jitters in uh, crypto investors and, and traders we'll we'll get into whether you know how how valid uh, those jitters are then uh, binance recall they they had set up this kind of backstop for for crypto this fund to invest in in different startups and crypto projects so now it has um, topped that up with uh, two billion in contributions from from Jump and others. And then finally, we also got an update on the Tornado Cash saga. If you recall, this was kind of the biggest story before the whole FTX thing broke. Um, it kind of has faded out a little bit, but it's a huge story. Um, Alex Pertsev, uh, the one of the developers of Tornado Cash, was. Uh, jailed uh, three months ago in Amsterdam with no charges. We have an update on that trial. Um, our video team was there live, uh, seeing seeing that trial. So uh, we we have all the scoops on on that one as well. Um, and uh, well, I forgot to introduce myself and our uh, <laughs> and the rest of the team. So I'm I'm Cami. I'm the Defiant founder. And uh, there's uh, here's YYC Trader, our head of news, Alex and Owen, our brilliant staff reporters, re uh, you know, writing up all of these uh, news. And um, our sponsor for this week is Goldfinch. So shout out to them, and uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll uh, come back to them in, in, in a little bit. But yeah, let's start with the big news of the week, um, FTX Contagion. So Alex, can you walk us through what's, what's happening with, with DCG? 
Sure, I'll talk over the sound of the espresso machine in the background at this New York cafe. So, um, yeah, the, the DCG looks like it might be the next domino to fall. Now, I don't want to overstate the odds of that happening, but basically the concern is a DCG, Digital Currency Group, is a huge company in crypto. Um, it's it's kind of under the radar because its subsidiaries are, are, are more well-known, right? So think Coindesk, um, think Genesis, uh, spot trading and lending uh, company, uh, there's also Grayscale, which is really its cash cow. So last week, I think most people have probably heard of this, but Genesis is lending arm. Uh, they halted withdrawals. And anybody who's been paying attention to the markets this year knows that halting withdrawals is usually a pretty bad sign, and it's often followed suit by bankruptcy. And um, indeed, news reports came out shortly after it halted withdrawals that A, uh, seeking uh, an emergency loan worth a billion dollars, and B, that it was exploring bankruptcy. Now, that, as far as I know, isn't a done deal. It's it, it likely, but but hasn't happened just yet. But the, the concern is, um, will should Genesis file for bankruptcy if this uh, lending and trading firm is actually insolvent? Uh, could it bring down DCG along with it? And DCG is huge. So if, if Genesis were to topple its parent company, that would be catastrophic. And the, the fact of the matter is that people don't know what's going to happen because DCG is a, a centralized company, just like FTX was. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to lump, lump it in really with, with FTX because we know that there is a lot of shady stuff going on there. But the point is that its books are closed. So we don't actually know exactly what its liabilities are, what it's valued at now. Um, we just we we don't have all the numbers to do the math to know whether a bankruptcy would would uh, bring DCG down along with it. And the, the problem there is, uh, you know, I mean, why why would that be such a big deal? Well, because uh, Grayscale, one of the subsidiary firms, is holding a lot of Bitcoin and a lot of Ether. And if if Grayscale were to be liquidated and if its holdings of cryptocurrencies were to be sold on the market, that enormous supply influx would probably send uh, the value of, of those two main cryptocurrencies and probably everything else along with it plummeting to fresh lows this year. So that's that's really the, the issue summed up. So it's it's that's the complete worst case scenario, right? Uh, DCG having to liquidate GBTC yeah. funds, which just, uh, sorry, Grayscale funds, which just on GBTC is 10 billion plus in Bitcoin and that would yeah. crash the market. Did you get a sense from your sources on how likely this would be and, and whether there are any other uh, steps that it can take before getting there like are are they going to be raising funds uh to to uh to be able to service the loans that they have coming due next year or uh, yeah. i don't know is there any other way that 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 they can come afloat without actually selling grayscale yes yeah, so that's a good thing that you, you you bring up the 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 money that we know that it owes isn't due for a little while it isn't due until right. sometime in 2023 so that, that that's a good thing right um but it opinions are mixed uh some people that i spoke to are, are thinking well man we just don't know it could or it couldn't right like it like genesis could topple uh dcg and grayscale could could get liquidated we we don't know and then um another source that i spoke to who's who's like very much an expert on on grayscale and, and its funds gbtc and and dcg uh james safard at bloomberg intelligence he's uh he, he thinks that it's all very unlikely he because it, simply because the the collateral damage from unwinding GBTC and unleashing ten billion dollars worth of Bitcoin into the market would be too great. It's just not. It's just not worth it. It's not worth doing that to save the parent company. Um, so he doesn't think that that's going to happen. And, and I and maybe other people might take some solace in that. Um, but but somebody else pointed out to me because they yeah they, 
they're trying to raise money. I mean, they were looking for that billion dollar emergency uh, loan and nobody was really biting. Um, and the question is now, does, G does DCG have the assets to, to plug that hole? I mean, this, this started uh, this summer, actually. Um, it's funny, it's like all of the problems that we're talking about now, FTX, DCG, it all kind of goes back to three arrows and three arrows goes back to Luna, right? So it's like that first crash this year really in a way set everything off. I mean, it's not to, to take away from the fact that SBF, St. Bankman Freed at FTX was likely doing criminal stuff, right? But but um, when, when three arrows collapsed, well, they had borrowed $2.3 billion from Genesis uh, and they had they put up about a billion dollars worth of collateral. So the, the, the hole there was about $1.1 billion. And it seems as though DCG assumed that liability. Right. So, so DCG took on the bad debt from Genesis. And the question is, does DCG have that money lying around to just plug that hole? Um, maybe not because they're trying to raise that money, but nobody's nobody's biting nobody's uh, kind of hopping in on that investment opportunity and so you know one of my sources was like you know it makes you wonder right maybe they don't have the cash maybe they're kind of screwed um, so somebody, yeah. else, somebody else I spoke to insisted that Genesis would be filing for bankruptcy um, within the next couple of days. So I'll be very keen on seeing whether that happens and the next communication to come from DCG, should that happen. Yeah, we will be all over this story, obviously. Um, pretty much, you know, the biggest thing happening in, in crypto right now. Uh, there was a, also another update in this FTX uh, collapse um, earlier this week, the, the hacker uh, started moving funds. How 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 much do you remember, Alex? How much were, were they so able to, to when, cash out? When we ran that story, um, it had been of the uh, I think five hundred million. They they were they cashed up fifty nine million. But since then, they've actually moved out of that first wallet. They've moved all of their money out and spread it across many different wallets. And actually, as of last night, it seems as though the hacker has started using a mixing service to launder the funds. And this is, I'm, I'm going to cite Zach XBT here, the, the crypto investigator who's just all over every big hack. Um, props to him. Uh, as of like nine hours ago, they had moved uh, just under 400 Bitcoin through this mixing service. Yeah. Um, and shout out to, to Owen who first wrote this, this story uh, on the FTX hacker cashing out. But it's some like secondary point that to me is interesting is how the hacker is swapping ETH for Bitcoin and using Bitcoin mixing services to cash out. I think maybe because of, you know, Tornado Cash being sanctioned now. I mean, that's just speculation on why he, he might be, you know, swapping ETH for Bitcoin, but Maybe it's interesting, just like a, a side point that right now it's being, right now it's easier to launder illicit funds via Bitcoin than via ETH. Uh, at least this is what this hacker uh, is doing. But anyways, that, that that's a, a side note you, there. Any idea why it would be easier to, so much easier to do it through Bitcoin than through, than through ETH? There isn't enough uh, volume these days on Tornado because after the sanctions hit, everyone pulled funds, right? Like, so, um, like, the, like how mixers work is that there's a bunch of ETH deposited by various people, right? And then you you're, you make a deposit and then it gets kind of gets commingled and lost in that entire pool of funds, right? But if the pool itself is small, you can't put, like, 500 million worth of ETH in there because it'll be very easy to track when it comes out the other end mm -hmm. you know what i mean so i think that's one of the main reasons why he's using a bitcoin mixing service and um i mean initially he swapped from stable coins to eth right after the hack so it seems like he's just like making it up as he goes along you know he's like all right like i've seen everyone go through tornadoes so this is how i do it and then he's like oh maybe this won't work right so he's like okay now let me swap for bitcoin i don't know it's just uh 
I mean, it it doesn't look like a professional organization or a liquidator or anyone yeah. doing it, you know. So, yeah, I guess yeah. we'll just have to see what happens next. For sure. Um, okay, let's get to the the next big story: uh, privacy concerns around MetaMask and Uniswap. I mean, these are just you know two of the biggest. Uh, I guess they're just like foundational pieces of DeFi and there, there's these concerns about uh, user privacy, which is one of the main values that people in decentralized finance hold. So um, really interesting story going on here. Uh, Owen, do you want to uh, lead this one? Sure. Um, okay. So <clears throat> basically, uh on November 23rd, Consensus updated its privacy policy to inform MetaMask users that, um, which is more than 20 million people, uh, that their IP that their IP address and Ethereum addresses are going to be collected when they transact using Infura, which is uh, an RPC provider. And I mean, the the big upshot is that um, you know crypto is supposed to be a fairly you're supposed to be able to transact in a fairly anonymous way or pseudonymous way. And that, that now IP addresses and, um, Ethereum addresses are being tracked kind of, I mean, in some ways, um, I feel like it, 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 it hurts one of the basic tenants of crypto, which is can transact without people needing to know who we are. And if MetaMask, MetaMask knows what your IP address is, you know, seems i don't want to speculate too much but it seems like you could block people based on knowing their ip address and i mean there's also a way in which you can maybe characterize the way ethereum is being used if you can know where it's where its users are using ethereum from you know the sec can arguably maybe make a case that the us that like if if the majority of users are in the usa that Ethereum, it comes under the United States' uh, jurisdiction. So, you know, kind of um, kind of worrying. And on, on the flip side, or not even on the flip side, in the same vein, we, Uniswap also um, updated its privacy policy, policy to say that they will share wallet with third parties in the event of regulatory or legal proceedings. And in the same vein, it, it, it feels... It again just feels like um, a bit of encroachment upon the freedom which crypto believes in, and it's it's always been this tough contrast of like you know crypto. The whole thing is adoption, and that's the whole story that everyone is kind of betting on long term. And simultaneously, as we move forward, you're going to have to encounter more and more serious regulations and more and more serious pressures from institutions to provide information about who's transacting and you know i mean we're circumventing kyc so you know as crypto grows it's gonna it's gonna encounter all these things and you could almost argue that in a bear market people are you know crypto is in a weak position to to bargain in a certain sense and we, we may people may institution or you know pro crypto people may need to give up certain um, in order to serve, may need to do certain things. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, uh, worrying. I mean, but the devil's in the details and we'll have to see how, how things proceed as far as the way, I don't know, the way, the way specifically the information is being used and how it can be circumvented, like how effective are VPNs, how effective is using a different RPC, how easy that is for users. So ongoing worth monitoring and we'll be there to monitor it so yeah i think it's worth pointing out that you know this is kind of for 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 those who are worried about preserving their privacy it's not kind of the end of metamask you know there are options you can switch your rpc provider to alchemy or you know some some other uh, a way to access the, the Ethereum blockchain that's that's not Infura. So in, Infura and MetaMask are both owned by consensus. So that's the link there of, mm -hmm. I think, why if you're only if you're using Infura, your IP with MetaMask, your IP is, is being stored. 
but you know i think there's there's this option of uh, using another rpc um you can also use a vpn uh, to mask your ip so there there are alternatives and in the case of uniswap yeah i i guess the at, at least what's happening there is they, they are not storing users ip and and wallets they but they they say that if they're being you know compelled to by law enforcement then they'll give up a user's wallet addresses not ip addresses and you know that, that's important because uh the i think the way that that uh an external party can identify blockchain users is by linking ip addresses with with wallets if you just have a wallet i think that's harder to do but yeah uh it, and, and also it, it's not like Uniswap is holding all this information right you know for 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 everyone it's only if they are they're being forced to do so they they'll, they'll hand that over so I think you know it's it, it obviously caused a lot of backlash and, and promotion, but it, I don't think it's. I mean, it's not it's not so bad. I, I guess there, there are alternatives, and you know if worse comes to worse, you can always fork the code yeah. for these things or, or use other wallets as well. I, I wonder if this is if the data or if the wallet is. Hmm. If it's being, I guess it doesn't make sense that it'd be tracked on the front end if it's an address, but I, I do wonder if it can, if you can circumvent the, them tracking in, in, in some way. Um, I don't know. This is maybe more of a off record conversation to have with someone, but yeah, yeah I just wonder the details about how they're, how they're collecting, because I mean, anyone can, you know, you can go on a block explorer and see who's using Uniswap and see their address. So I do wonder. You know what is what exactly does this mean um, right what exactly is being stored yeah 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 exactly because you know mm -hmm. we can we can anyone can find out all the addresses that uh interact with uniswap so i wonder wonder what's going on there and i do know that uniswap's code is i think immutable like they don't they can't even i think it's non-upgradable so um i i just just like it's it's fairly uncensorable at that level Mm -hmm. I guess shout out Eunice that way. Um, so yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it's always you know distinguishing between Uniswap Labs, the company who needs to answer to law enforcement. You know they're a New York-based company, I believe. So obviously, you know under under a lot of scrutiny, nobody wants Hayden to go to jail. So you know if uh, the FBI or somebody comes and tells them you need to do this, they, they're going to have to comply. But the Uniswap protocol remains decentralized and censorable. And, you know, as we, we've seen before with kind of the Uniswap front end having to censor some users in, in sanctioned countries, for example, uh, the Uniswap protocol can still be accessed by, by anyone. So I think it's, it's still important to make that di distinction between the company and the protocol. Um, and then <clears throat> speaking of censorship, uh, the, the other big story this week was this update on, uh, on Tornado Cash. So recall that in, I think it was in August, uh, that this, uh, this Alexei Pertsev, um, uh, developer for Tornado Cash was jailed in Amsterdam. And before that, a Tornado Cash, the protocol was sanctioned by the, the US Treasury Department. And this was really unusual. It was the first time that a piece of code was put in a sanctions list. And um, Coin Center and others are actually litigating against this action because of how highly unusual it is. Usually, you know, the what goes into an OFAC list, and 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 these these are the lists that um, the U.S. uses to prohibit any U.S. persons of transacting with different entities that are a threat to national security. So usually. What goes on and who goes on those lists are 
individuals or companies, but never, you know, they've never added an actual kind of protocol, like open source piece of code, like tornado caches to OFAC. So that was highly unusual. And then even more unusual was the fact that this tornado cache developer was jailed in Amsterdam without uh, any charges um, very, you know, very soon after the tornado cache sanctions. Um, now this week we had the first update on the trial and it was very interesting. We heard from, from both sides. We have our, part of our video team is actually based in the Netherlands. So we had kind of first, a first-hand view on uh, how the trial went. Really recommend you guys watch our video on this. Uh, here's the, the, the thumbnail. Um, and so what happened here is that they actually did finally uh, charge Alexei Pertsev with um, money laundering uh, charges. So that, uh, that allowed, uh, you know, the, the justice system in, in the Netherlands to keep uh, the de this uh, developer in jail. So, you know, very, uh, very unfortunate development for, for, you know, open source uh, and for, for Tornado Cash. So we'll, we'll keep monitoring this. And uh, also we are working on, a, on our first installment of what we'll call, we actually don't have a name for the show yet, but it's gonna be a monthly show. That's going to be a, a mini kind of docu-series on a, like a, a big story in crypto. And our first one will be on Tornado Cash. So we'll go in depth on this story and we, we hope to publish this pretty soon. So, um, you know, keep an eye out uh, for that. So, so yeah, I guess lots of like a bit troubling news this week, right? For, for privacy, for open source development with MetaMask tracking our IPs. Uniswap um, giving up our wallet ad addresses in case law enforcement says so. Uh, the this Tornado Cash developer still in jail, uh, and this on top of all the FTX news. <laughs> uh, it, it wasn't a great week. Um, <laughs> Blue skies. I don't know. No we, worries. We need, it's all good. <laughs> we need some good news, guys. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to those listening, give us a new DeFi primitive. Yeah. That's what we need. <laughs> okay. Um, before we 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 continue with markets, uh, which more more bad news <laughs> with with uh, WBTC paying, um, let's hear a word from our sponsor, Goldfinch. Goldfinch is a decentralized credit protocol with a mission to connect the world's capital to the world's growth, with yield from real-world lending and loans collateralized by real-world assets. The protocol has announced Goldfinch membership, empowering Goldfinch investors and aligning the protocol's participants with the network's long-term success. Upgrade your participation for enhanced yields from member rewards and own the new global credit paradigm. Sign up for the waitlist today at goldfinch.finance slash membership. Yes, check out Goldfinch, please. They are very nice and awesome sponsor. So go check them out, go, go use them. And, and yeah, so, okay, let's get back to news this week. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about markets and the big story right now is on wrapped BTC. Um, why we see you want to lead this one? Uh, sure. Um, so wrapped Bitcoin or WBTC is basically um, the biggest uh, Bitcoin uh, token on Ethereum. So basically why it exists is because um, uh, to use DeFi, um, your tokens need to be ERC-20s, right? They need to follow the token standard, uh, which is why you can't actually even use regular ETH in DeFi. You need to, uh, you know, uh, and that's why we have wrapped ETH, you know, which lets it uh, interact with contracts, etc. So 
in order to bring Bitcoin into the DeFi ecosystem, uh, WBTC was created. So what it does is essentially BitGo, which is the custodian for uh, WBTC, uh, takes Bitcoin from whoever wants WBTC, custodies it, and issues you an equivalent amount of WBTC on Ethereum. Um, so traditionally, and uh, I mean, almost since it launched, it's always traded uh, pretty close to its uh, one-to-one peg. But ever since FTX collapsed, it's been trading at a slight discount. I, I, I wouldn't go far as to call it a DPEG because it's like barely 1% so far. So, uh, you know, given that, uh, you know, market conditions are tight and, you know, uh, <clears throat> liquidity has dried up, I wouldn't read too much into it just yet. But what are the concerns right now? I mean, given what's happening with Grayscale and, uh, you know, FTX, Contagion, um, and the depegging of wrapped Bitcoin and ETH on Solana uh, last week, I think investors are just scared. Uh, you know that uh, are all the Bitcoin that BitGo is supposed to hold that's backing WBTC, is it all safe? Has it been pledged? Do they have other kind of uh, arrangements? You know, because with these centralized companies, as we've seen over the, this month, these uh, entanglements only come to light when things go wrong, right? They could have done uh, anything behind the scenes. And because it's a black box uh, and not on chain, we don't know uh, really what's what's going on. Uh, Chris Black, uh, you know, our favorite DeFi watchdog, has been uh, talking about the WBTC DAO's multi-sig for, I think, the better part of a year now. Apparently, it's been dormant and hasn't sent any transactions. Um, but uh, this morning, um, someone from uh, BitGo, uh, what's his name, Victor Tran, he actually um, tweeted that they are setting up a new multisig now. Uh, let me just share that if I can. Yeah, so, so what does this mean for WBTC, essentially? Uh, I think the biggest concern is that... Uh, the fallout that a potential collapse could have on DeFi as a whole. Because if you look at the contract, the three largest holders of WBTC are Maker, Aave, and Compound because they've been pledged as collateral, right? So Maker has 540 million worth, uh, Aave 400 and Compound 250, Mm. right? So uh, obviously these protocols are well-equipped to handle liquidations uh, you know, on a, on a regular basis. But if you have an asset that implodes and goes to zero, it's impossible. You know what I mean? There's no getting around bad debt. Like this would be basically like Luna collapsing to zero in a matter of hours, right? So there's no way that any blockchain can keep up or like, um, in the first case, what would happen is liquidity for it would dry up because all the LPs would pull out as soon as it happened, right? So there would be no way to exit WBTC mm. because no one wants it. Right. So, of course, this is worst case scenario. I don't think this is uh, what we're heading for because uh, I think it's just overblown and people are worried about uh, potential entanglements that BitGo has. Yeah. So um, I don't know if this is the best chart to show the the discount. Why we see it. I, I just pulled this up on, on TradingView, but maybe there's a better uh, tool Yeah, let me just send this. it one second. If you can it's send an... it over... Discord, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. I didn't realize how deeply entwined WBTC was by some of the biggest DeFi protocols. That was surprising to hear. So, worth watching. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, yeah, but, you know, oh, there, there you can see it more clearly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, As you can see, it started exactly when FTX collapsed on uh, November 9th, mm-hmm. right? And since then, it's been kind of uh, a bit wobbly. And uh, in the same thread, actually, uh, Victor Tran said that one of the redemptions that's kind of gumming up the works is FTXs. And potentially that needs like a legal consult or something. So I think it's more of mm-hmm. like the pipes being a bit gummed up at the moment because, uh, you know, uh, there's uh, like liquidity is dried up across the board. Like I said, like market mm-hmm. makers are hesitant to kind of get in and everyone's kind of just taken like a step back and is waiting to see how 
DCG and everything else plays out, right? So, okay, to, to just like summarize, uh, FTX had Bitcoin in, in kind of in Bitco, in BitGo or in, they had exchanged Bitcoin for wrapped, wrapped BTC. And now they are trying to redeem that and that's causing this congestion. Is that right? It's one of the factors, according to uh, what he said. Let me see if I can just. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, here it is. Let me just send that to you as well. But um, yeah, at least... I mean, I, I took a look at the curve pool, TriCrypto, which is one of mm -hmm. like the oldest uh, and most popular pools, right? And it's still pretty well balanced, uh, about 32% um, BTC, ETH and um, USDT. So it doesn't look like people are bailing on uh, WBTC, at least in DeFi mm -hmm. for now. Um, so yeah, and and a couple of other observers also said that there is um, uh, arbitrage going on. It's just that it's at a slower pace than usual. So, which is why like it's trading under its peg for an extended period. Okay, um, and and like you said, I mean, at, at least there there is a clear way to see that WBTC is in fact pegged, you know, one to one to Bitcoin, like the. The funds are there. So, yep, absolutely. I mean, on the site, let me just, uh, yeah, here it is. <clears throat> let me send that to you as well. Uh, I mean, you can see all the addresses and the uh, Bitcoin held in custody. So, I don't think that's really a concern, like that the Bitcoin itself has been moved. But I think people are more worried about like off chain arrangements, like. You know, if mm. someone if they pledged it to someone else for a loan or something like that, and we like we would never know that, right? Because it would sit in these addresses until one fine day it's moved out, and they say, "Oh, we had to pay this loan or something." I see. Ah, uh, it's you know, all these off-chain dealings are messing up crypto. Everything needs to be on chain. <laughs> yeah. Um. Oh, yeah, it's just a big theme. It's it's, but it it seemed to have worked. I saw Coin Market Cap started showing reserves. I don't know how accurate their data was, but you know they had a whole pop up. I went there and saying they were showing uh, reserves for exchanges. So it does seem to have proliferated throughout the industry. The awareness that yeah, you need to prove you have what you say you have. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think ahead. one challenge with proof of reserves is you need to see liabilities at the same time too. Mm -hmm. That's, I think one of the biggest questions when it comes to exchange reserves, because you can say, yes, I have a hundred billion dollars, which is great yeah. and good because it's like, oh, a big number. But <laughs> if you were supposed to have 200 billion is what you've taken in from your users, that's yeah. not really a good thing, right? Yeah. And so you need to see both sides of the uh, equation to say, okay, this exchange is safe or not. Yeah. And I don't think yeah. anyone's come up with like an effective way uh, I'm not sure whether the Merkle proof trees of reserves actually take into account liabilities as well. So mm -hmm. I guess we'll have to wait and see. I, yeah. Go ahead, Cammy. Oh, no, no. Uh, just, just like, I do wonder, like, I wonder, I, I wouldn't want to like throw the baby out with the bathwater. And obviously this sounds mm -hmm. like a feature we should write, but um, I, I would wonder if it's a step in the right direction for proof of reserves in that people to whom a given exchange has liabilities could they could at least see what they say they have and like maybe talk to each other and be like okay like how much do they owe, how much do they owe you and maybe a step in the right direction in terms of people being able to put their heads together and say wait a second they don't actually have enough um, mm -hmm. but I, I yeah again it's a pretty detailed discussion so I'm not sure how I'll play yeah no I think at least you know we're seeing steps in the right direction uh, more needs to be done but this could be a silver lining or at least a, like something positive to come out of this big mess you know uh, crypto users and investors start demanding proof of reserves from all of the centralized parties that uh, that they're using and i guess this this is what we're seeing um, another market story uh, that we covered this week was uh, how 
crypto uh, perpetuals open interest really took a hit uh, after uh, the FTX collapse. So it looks like, you know, FTX <clears throat> accounted for a big chunk of, of volume, but when when it collapsed, that didn't really go anywhere. It just left with it. Is 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 that right, YYC? Um, yeah, it seems like, you know, volumes just kind of fell off a cliff and open interest as well, meaning, um, so in terms of volume, FTX had about a 10% share and it looks like most of that went straight to Binance, mm. uh, whereas nothing else really moved. And while we were hoping that, uh, you know, uh, all the centralized exchange FUD would push people to DeFi, uh, turns out that wasn't the case because, um, uh, uh, chain chain analysis put out a report saying that uh, you know there was an uptick in activity on Uniswap and stuff, which is what we saw and we reported on, right? That mm -hmm. there was a huge surge in activity, but it turns out it was just one big MEV bot that was cleaning up a bunch of transactions. Because as you know, people were trading amid the volatility, it was just sandwiching and front running them left and right. <laughs> that was really disappointing. We're like, oh yay, DeFi is getting more more usage. <laughs> Fine. Yeah, no, not really. I mean, not yet, right? And I think mm -hmm. you you did a uh, you put up a thread on that, right? That you mm -hmm. know, DeFi is great. I mean, we love it, like because we're in it, but it's not ready for prime time, as in for a general, normal user of a bank app or a fintech app to like dive into DeFi. I mean, we don't, we still don't have that. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, your average person like doesn't want to like, I don't know, participate in arbitrage and move stable coins around. So, you know, you have to def define what you mean by using DeFi. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. Like for most people, like Anchor would have been like the, the perfect product, like, and which is why it got so many people because it was like marketed as simple, right? Just deposit your money. It's a stable coin, 20%. What could go wrong? Right. So yeah. the thing is, you can still get that product like a, a US dollar savings account. Mm -hmm. The the problem is that it won't be a 20% <laughs> <laughs> savings account. I mean, if you're seeing, I think, I mean, that, that, that was a lesson from Luna. Like if it looks too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, we've, we've talked about this before. It's like the reason why we're not seeing all of these burned CFI users come to DeFi is because you know DeFi is not ready for them yet, but we, we believe it we believe it will be. And um, speaking of stable coins, uh, Owen, you had a story on what on what's going on with with that market. Sure. Uh, yeah. Sorry, so before we uh, move on, could I just answer a couple of questions that we have in the chat? Oh yeah, go for okay. it. So uh, Tom asks us, uh, what price or ratio do you think WBTC could be pegged to without, uh, you know, causing like a bomb to go off in DeFi, right? So I don't think it's, uh, to answer your question, I don't think it's a particular price or ratio. It's the speed of the move, mm -hmm. right? So if it gradually starts trading lower and, you know, there's more FUD, et cetera, that's fine because lending protocols can handle that and, you know, it'll be orderly and stuff. But if it's a disorderly liquidation, in which case like BitGo comes out suddenly hypothetically and says, okay, a third of our Bitcoin is gone or something like that, you know, then it could be a, a complete mess because then you'd see a repeat of what happened on Solana, you know, where you had a so BTC and so ETH that uh, uh, fell, f I, I think, 90% in a matter of a couple of days. So that completely wrecked the ecosystem. So hopefully we don't see that. Right on. Yeah. Someone said uh, GMX uh, open interest is way up, which uh, we should maybe check out next week. Morning. Actually, yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, GMX and DYDX have both seen, uh, you know, increased interest, but given the mm -hmm. size of per perpetuals on centralized exchanges, it's still a drop in the bucket, you know? So mm -hmm. the overall pie has shrunk a lot. But yes, they do have a slightly bigger piece of it. Okay, good to know. Um, yes. Yeah. I can pick up stable coins. So yeah, uh, this was it was kind of a frustrating story. We were we started looking at yields to see if there was a trend with 
yields coming out of the FTX uh, collapse. And it seemed like it was kind of a mixed bag as stable coins shuffled around DeFi. I mean, I, I took the, just looked at the top, the, the, the top five places where people can deposit stable coins in DeFi in terms of TVL and overall they dropped 18%. Um, but we saw, I think it was curve, but you know, it wasn't, but that was, uh, overall, like I think the UC, yeah, Uniswap's die USDC pool, um, gained, uh, 86 million in TVL at the, from November 6th to when I wrote this, which was November 23rd and but the curve um, three pool, which is Dai, USDC, and USDT, lost 97 million. So it was kind of a mixed bag in terms of where people were moving their stables. There didn't seem to be a hugely clear trend there. Um, I mean, generally out, which was um, I suppose to be expected as people were unnerved. But even that was surprising to me, as it felt like I feel like DeFi users are more more sophisticated than your average crypto holder and it seems to be common knowledge that the DeFi protocols actually worked pretty well and so i was surprised to see that overall there was a trend of stable coins leaving um and yields have kind of normalized they're all within um 30 basis points of where they were before kind of the ftx collapse started so we've kind of seen everything stabilize since then so that, that was kind of my main takeaway. It was kind of, I was looking for something big, um, but nothing huge happened. I mean, I, I sucked to talk to Sam. I don't want to butcher his last name, but Kaismian, Kaismian of uh, Frax Finance. And, you know, he, he was, he, I mean, he it sounded like he was battening down the hatches and felt like he just felt like there were some unknown unknowns that could be coming and he said they were just trying to be as conservative and you know professional as possible in order to survive and frax is the fifth biggest stable coin so um it was yeah you know Fra i mean yeah it was interesting hearing his take and just that you know he just was like we you know you, you always want to think you're out of the woods i mean i thought i'd seen it all with luna but you know he's just saying you, you still got to be careful and what that looks like in practice i'm not sure but yeah, especially with the DCG speculation hanging over our heads right now. But yeah, like like you're saying, there was obviously this huge drop in overall TVL right after uh, FTX news broke, and and then yeah, like things have been kind of stabilizing. So yeah, it was it was surprising. To see that just like those net outflows of stable coins, both from CFI and from, from DeFi. Um, mm -hmm. because I mean, if you're in stable coins, you know, you're you're not exposed to volatility. If you're in DeFi, you're you know using protocols that have been battle tested and have just continued to work through all this drama. But I guess you know, people are still it just shows you how rattled the market is right now with everything that's happening um yeah. yeah 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 i mean my one guess was like you know i mean we we've written stories about you know rising interest rates and that there are i mean sophisticated DeFi users who i'm sure are looking at those interest rates and you know if they're seeing all this you know all the drama they can just say i don't want to be a part of this but i mean and that's not necessarily a rational decision, but you could see the FTX drama maybe pushing them over the edge and going back into U.S. Treasuries. I mean, absolutely. Like crypto and DeFi has a lot more competition now. Like we're not in a zero or negative rate environment. Like a, a, just like a plain vanilla yeah. time deposit is giving you, you know, maybe sometimes more, like higher yields than you can get in Aave. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and, and that's like an insured deposit. So yeah, we're my seeing... savings account is at three percent. Nice. Look at that. Nice. nice. Like it's... <laughs> bring that on chain. You got to bring that on chain. Yeah. <laughs> High yield account at this at this point. Yeah. I mean, my bank's offering five percent now on a one year CD, so which is I mean, your... <laughs> five. Yeah. So I mean, it's definitely competition for DeFi. I mean, mm -hmm. stablecoin yields are like. I mean, it's, I don't want to talk about it really. So, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> we're doing a bad mood where we see <laughs> yeah um you have to okay. go really out the degen curve to kind of get a decent yield on stables these days either either leverage up like basic farms or go for a degen farm so it's either way it's not i mean as easy as it was good thing we have you as our degen sherpa to guide us in, in that quest yeah yes but you know we've been kind of uh, holding back with the sharing like degen stuff in our weekly alphas this month just because you know uh the environment isn't right for it you know you'd rather stay safe you know stick it out for a couple of months let all the dust settle and then you know you can deploy again uh, with peace of mind now there's a recession coming now is the great time to swing big and to make a lot of money before <laughs> Everything oh my god, apart. this is not financial advice, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, no, I mean I, I think that's it's it's tough because yeah, to, to get like higher yields in DeFi, you really have to go for the risky stuff. And I don't think anyone is in the mood for risky right now. Uh quite the opposite as, as we're seeing. So yeah, it's um, like you might bridge to some chain and then two days later that bridge collapses, you know, and you're yeah. like the farm might be safe, but your money is still gone. <laughs> oh, wow. It, you're saying uh, come to Brazil, you get 9% uh, savings account. But yeah, at 11% inflation, I don't think that's a, that's a great deal. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, there, there was another interesting story, Owen, that, that you wrote on this, um, this CRV trade on Aave. You want to go sure. through it? Sure. Um, I brushed the dust off because ages, but um, basically, our one of our favorite DGENs who is still swinging in crypto, Eisenberg. Um, what's his first name? Abraham. Abraham Eisenberg. Um, so he he was the guy who initially um, exploited Mango for over a hundred million in October, um, and you know he called. Um, that was his profitable trading strategy. He didn't, it wasn't an exploit. It, it's just, he understood the mechanics of mango better than most people did and was able to, I actually don't remember the details of it, but um, he was able to make off with, uh, yeah, I think a hundred million dollars. And there was a governance proposal, which served somewhat like a bug bounty and had him taking away, I don't know, like in the, in that very, very basic range. Um, and so, but he's back again and he posted earlier this month, um, like a strategy that he felt like could leave Ave with bad debt. And then he carried it out um, over the past week. And the basic idea was that he had USDC, which I believe he got from the Mango Markets attack. Um, wow. Yeah. And so, you know, now he's funding his DJ activities. Um, great pastime. Um <laughs> And so, yeah, so he, so he deposited USDC, he borrowed curve against USDC on Aave, sold that curve for more USDC. So, and, um, so essentially was looping that, um, was looping that position and it, it gets complicated and we might have to call on YYC a bit, but I had some interesting conversations with people about it. But, um, basically the idea is that he, he was levered. So if, curves price increased he would be liquidated which actually ended up happening because all the curve he owed relative to the usdc's value would force a liquidation so there was and that that ended up happening and ave uh ended up having bad debt because the liquidations weren't fast enough which led to 1.6 in uh bad debt for the protocol which it which it covered easily um and they have mechanisms in place to deal with that. Um, but th there was, I thought the most interesting part of the story, and I was talking to someone off record about it a bit, was that people weren't sure what kind of game of chess Berg was playing in terms of what he was doing off chain. Like, did he, did he think that people would try to liquidate him? So did he have a long on curve? Um, did he have, like, it looked like he was shorting curve. Um, but did he have did he have uh, some kind of other position on a sex which had a, which was which was long curve and could he make money there 
or was he doing this to prove that Ave didn't work? And did he have a short on Ave's Ave token? Um, mm-hmm. So it was kind of um, it was a it was a mysterious thing, and I'm not sure the current status, but it was some some serious DJ and action, which I thought was interesting and had some downstream effects, like you saw Gauntlet, which works with Ave, kind of reevaluating the amount of leverage people can take out and also like what assets were um people were able to borrow um getting a little long-winded here guys so you can <laughs> if you, you could cut me off but um you know um, okay okay anyways i can keep going but um anyways so but we don't know exactly how much money he made of this complex trade yeah then. because we don't know he was doing uh in centralized finance so he could have been doing multiple things that um multiple bets and um okay. So it's this this guy is like I think he's becoming a, a bit of a like DeFi um not not celebrity, but he's he's like you know building a name for himself as this like DGen exploiter. Uh and interesting that he warned of this attack, if you wanna call it that, or strategy, maybe is, is a better word ahead of time and then he just went ahead and and did it and executed and left Ave with a 1.6 million in bad debt. I guess like another interesting thing to point out here is how you mentioned that this bad debt was like very quickly and automatically filled, um, which is, you know, not the same. We can't say the same for, you know, centralized counterparts. Uh, yeah. which you know fair and i mean they, they have like bigger holes to fill with, like with billions of of, of no, bad but, debt yeah but but you make a great point but someone said you know it's like people knew within a day that ave had bad debt and they they dealt with it and there were responses on a governance forum i mean it, it, it's not great obviously but it's like you know we had bad debt floating around from 3ac i saw someone tweet this for you know six months that no one quite knew about so yeah. Yeah, in this case, we knew instantly and it was, you know, it was solved. So another another point for, for DeFi. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay. And then the last segment of our weekly recap, there were, there were tons of like different tech uh, updates and, and developments to point out. So maybe, you know, th- this can be just like the good news section. If if you guys are are looking to you know get teared up a, a little bit after all the doom and gloom in in this in this live stream, um, let's see. Uh, so okay, so I, I guess like maybe the the biggest kind of tech uh, update that we have is that Curve released its white paper uh, for for a stablecoin, um, and Alex did that story. So do you wanna? Walk us through it. Yeah, sure. So, um, you can hear the French music in the background. Um, so, Curve released its uh, the, the white paper for its new stable coin, a dollar pegged. And uh, it, it's funny because this happened, uh, you know, as, as um, Abraham was doing, you know, trying out his new highly profitable trading strategy. Um, and, and there was that speculation that they uh, they had released the white paper in order to to kind of blow up what seemed like his short position on their governance token CRV. Anyway, um, it sent the it sent the price of CRV soaring that morning, and it, it, it was the highest performing DeFi token that day. Right now, actually, uh, it is number two on the list of crypto tokens, uh, second best performing token uh, over the past seven days. It's still up 22% today relative to where it was a week ago. Um, what makes this interesting, what makes it a little bit different from other stable coins that are trying to hold a peg to a fiat currency is that uh, you, you, you get curve USD when you deposit collateral in the form of Ether. And if the if the value of that Ether that's posted as collateral begins to drop and approach the, the liquidation point, um, the protocol will automatically swap some of that Ether for USD, which is kind of going to 
stabilize that volatility a little bit. And then in reverse, as the price, price of Ether rises, any USD in your kind of collateral pool will get swapped back out for Ether. So it's kind of like a, a mechanism to protect people who have taken Curve USD, the stable coin, uh, and posted collateral to protect them from potential liquidation due to market volatility. Hmm. Nice. Um, so when when is this, is this kind of just like the white paper and it still needs to go through like a approval or like what's the timeline? Like when should we expect this new stable coin? That's actually a really good question. I don't have that answer off the top of my head. If, if one of you guys happens to know and wants to jump in, please let me know. But I'm not aware of them having undergone any audits on the code yet. Just somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, this is like super suspicious timing, right? <laughs> they released it just to wreck. Uh, uh, yeah, um, they did. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Is, yeah. is that the consensus uh, opinion now? Because I remember it was a little up in the air when, when I was writing about it. I mean, as as far as product launches go, you couldn't pick a worse time to launch anything, right? Like crypto is burning, DCG might like collapse any day. I mean, like sentiment is so bad. And this is when you choose to like drop like your biggest upgrade in like a year. I don't know. It just yeah. doesn't make yeah. sense. Yeah, and it's, just it's, when, it's just... you know, uh, this guy is like dumping millions worth of CRV on the open market, right? Yeah, hmm. and and just one point which I didn't add, but is that I I believe I believe that a uh, guy on the curve was borrowing against CRV, so he was also facing liquidation if curve got too low. I'm not exactly sure what number that was, but um, there, there was there was an extra incentive for someone on the team to drop something to pump the token if he was borrowing against that asset. So oh right, right. I heard about that. I believe he's the biggest borrower on um, Ave, right? Yeah, we're the biggest lender of CRV, right? Like yeah, he, yeah, 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 yeah. So another, uh, just a bit of evidence, you know. Wait, someone from the Curve team is the biggest lender of CRV on in, in Ave? Yeah, yeah. So if it had kept dumping, he would have been liquidated too. Oh, uh, that sounds so like sketchy like it shouldn't happen well, like it's it, business it's business <laughs> but in, in tradfi you know i i don't want to you know I, <laughs> that's that's like insider trading like if you're gonna okay well i i'm not i didn't say anything i don't want anyone to go to jail <laughs> but but doesn't sound that doesn't sound very legit um in any case yeah a lot of like sketchy you know suspicious business going on here with this curve thing with this curve news um and stable coin um okay let's let's run through the, uh, our other developments quickly because we're already over time so many news this week um okay but like i said this is kind of our good news uh section of the recap and uh i mean it was good news for for avalanche uh i guess they, they got some some sort of surge in in use um, or or in, in activity. Uh, yeah, like transactions were jumping. I, I'm not sure exactly what's driving this. Like, do, do you guys? The, the, Sam, uh, our Australian-based reporter, wrote this story. So unfortunately, he he can't make these um, live streams. It's like middle of the night for him. Um, but I don't have a lot of insights really into what's driving activity on Avalanche. But but there was this big spike for some reason. I don't know if, if any of you guys know what, what's going on here. Somebody's saying Solana Solana frogs migrating to, <laughs> to Avax. Could be. It could be. Yeah. No, that, that's not a bad uh, hypothesis, really. You know, I mean, we've covered a lot. Uh, we've been all over the Solana story how that ecosystem has really taken a huge hit. And so, if you know, if, if you're looking for uh, an alternative layer one, alternative to Ethereum, I mean, that's cheap um, and fast. Avalanche is a good choice. So that 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 I think that could be driving it. Um, but yeah, so. Good news here for for Avalanche. 
Um, and then good news for not only alt layer ones, but layer two uh, activities also up. So um, why we see, do you have more insights on what's happening here? Um, I mean, it's it's what was expected, right? When layer two season, so to speak, started earlier this year, that more people would take their transactions off mainnet mm -hmm. um, and start doing stuff on uh, layer two. Because now you have Uniswap curve, like all the major primitives are there. Plus, like even things like DeFi Saver, Instadap, you can do all those uh, automated strategies on layer two as well. Mm -hmm. So it's so much cheaper, right? So. Um, I do that too. So now when I want to use Uniswap V3, for example, to, uh, you know, average into ETH, for example, uh, I do that on Arbitrum or Optimism rather than on mainnet. Because just, I mean, gas fees are low right now, but still, why should you spend $15 when you can do it for 50 cents? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it makes I, sense. I think that's, that's been driving uh, activity on layer twos. And of course, um, Arbitrum has been leading the pack uh, for a while now. And I think that happened after um, uh, the Nitro upgrade that uh, was launched end of September. And uh, we covered the Arbitrum Odyssey in DeFi Alpha, which was basically like these series of tasks that you had to do on chain uh, in order to claim these NFTs and hopefully down the line, be uh, eligible for an airdrop. Um, yeah, so to answer Tom's question, so far, no further news on the airdrop. Uh, if you see the latest um, DeFi Alpha, we have it um, up to date in our airdrop section. So um, the Odyssey was paused, but then they also released like the, these on-chain quests through Guild, uh, where you need to buy like a few tokens and interact with some protocols. Um, so <clears throat> as of now, there's no additional insights as to when the token's going to come out or whatnot. I'm, I mean, if I was them, I would be waiting for market conditions to improve. Uh, any token that's come out in the last few months has just been dumped into the ground. For example, mm -hmm. uh, Hashflow finally launched their token uh, a couple of weeks ago, right after teasing it for like almost a year and uh, is immediately dumped 60% from opening day. Okay. Right? Because I mean, right now, uh, I think people are in just such a bad, uh, state of mind sentiment wise or even portfolio wise that if you give anyone free money they're just going to dump it so yeah uh, and you can't blame people too right like uh, meaning we've bag held stuff down 99 percent. so <laughs> <laughs> yeah it makes sense but i mean at least you know some some sign of life in in crypto and DeFi here with with avalanche transactions up layer two activity up as well um but yeah i mean i i agree i, I don't think it's the, the probably the right time to to launch a token uh, right now but in any case all of you uh listening should uh, subscribe to DeFi alpha that's our weekly newsletter coming out fridays where yyc trader and uh DeFi dad compile all the you know best strategies for, for DeFi for gaining yields. There's an airdrop uh, kind of airdrop watch section, um, which have uh, given heads up to multiple airdrops in, in the past. So it, it's a great newsletter to be subscribed to. So shout out uh, to, to DeFi Alpha. And then to, to wrap up, um, there, there was also this uh, this story uh, talking up to kind of um, more on the like better news side of things that uh, the Ethereum Foundation is uh, testing uh, staked ETH withdrawals. So, you know, with everything that's happening, there was even kind of more like speculation that. Um, ETH withdrawals would be for some reason delayed. And of course, that's making people nervous. Um, but, you know, this is already in development. Uh, it's, it's being tested uh, on, on multiple uh, test nets right now. Um, and we haven't really seen any concrete uh, news or announcement that this is 
being delayed at all. So, I mean, I think we can categorically say that uh, that that was really fun. Uh, and so, you, you can know. you can see it kind of in the market though. Lido's uh, Lido's token LDO is one of the biggest losers this week. Ah, and 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 you think that's driven by concerns that uh, that withdrawals will be delayed? I'm not aware of anything else that's happened this week that that might have yeah. caused that. So yeah, I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, yeah, great point. Yeah, so I mean, th there there has been this kind of like weighing fear and speculation that uh, that withdrawals will be delayed. You know, uh, as as you all probably know, when um, the Ethereum merge happened, the up the change to proof of stake happened. Um, that means that Ethereum is now running on proof of stake, but uh, the the state ETH can uh, withdrawals for that state ETH hasn't hasn't been enabled yet. So that's what's kind of being tested. And with everything that's happening, um, ETH stakers are for sure just like very anxious to to have that be enabled uh, for uh, for once. So. Anyways, this is this is being tested, and it looks like things are, are going according to plan. So yeah, I mean, it was always going to be a long process, right? Even when Shanghai goes live and withdrawals are enabled, it's not like you can just pull out your ETH and run away, right? There's a mm -hmm. withdrawal queue, right? So you have to get into that queue, and like this is all stuff that was known, yeah. right? I think it's market conditions, you know, bear market people are like, oh, you're holding us hostage, etc. Um, so yeah. I think uh, so far, I mean, the, the Ethereum team or the devs have uh, shown that, you know, they'd rather take the time. I mean, they do take a long, long time, but at least what they ship turns out to be, you know, smooth works, and yeah. works well. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I was personally, I was shocked with how smoothly the merge went, even though there were like a hundred different test nets that uh, did it before. Uh, so... Yeah, I mean, I think we just have to kind of uh, let them get to it when they do. And yeah, obviously, for those of us who've staked some ETH, uh, getting, uh, having it stuck indefinitely obviously isn't a good thing. But that's why we have all these LSDs and uh, random <clears throat> other ways to gain uh, liquidity, right? I mean, obviously, that doesn't help you if you like dump your ETH directly into the beacon chain, because then like you are stuck. But yeah. I think it's just a matter of time and uh, hopefully sentiment around the market improves as a whole and then no one will even want to withdraw their ETH, you know. Yeah, like, oh good. man, you know, we're in it for life. Like how it was. <laughs> I was never going to sell, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. You know, I think we should uh, just look at the Ethereum devs track record of shipping uh, very, you know, really flawlessly but after a, a, a long time of testing so that, that's what's going on right now okay so we're way over time and i feel bad because uh, i'm making my reporters work on <laughs> in, in the day after thanksgiving um but i'm sure you know it's uh, it's fun we're we're spending time talking about the the news that happened and is uh, spending time with you guys here uh, joining the live stream so thank you all for for joining and yeah come back next friday for you know we'll i don't know what what the next week will have for us so fingers crossed it's it's more good news than than bad news bye everyone thank you see you guys <laughs>